In 19th century Turkey, a hoard of gold is found in the ruins of a mythic city, then lost in the rubble of Hitler's war-torn Berlin. Today, a half century later, the treasure's fate may hinge on international negotiations concerning thousands of artworks missing since World War II. I'm John Rhys Davis. Join me as we go in search of the treasures of Troy, next on Archaeology. At the ancient site of Hisarlik in modern Turkey, the day begins with roll call. These Turkish day workers, like their fathers and their fathers before them, are excavating one of the most famous archaeological sites ever discovered, the legendary city of Troy. To the Greek poet Homer, this was hallowed ground. The site of the great siege of King Priam's high-walled citadel, of Hector and Achilles' mortal combat, of Helen, the face that launched a thousand ships. In 1870, Heinrich Schliemann, believing the Homeric legends were true, came in search of Troy. Three years later, Schliemann announced to an astonished world that he had done it, found the ruins of the fabled city. And in the rubble, he had discovered a fantastic treasure, what he thought was King Priam's gold. While scholars argued over just what it was that he had found, Schliemann shipped the gold off to a museum in Berlin, a museum next door to what would eventually become the Nazi Gestapo headquarters. It would disappear amid the ashes of World War II. For 20 years, a German museum curator has crisscrossed the globe in an exhaustive search for the missing gold. And now he thinks he's found it. Schliemann began his search with a myth. In the 19th century, most scholars thought Homer's Iliad poetic fiction. But for Schliemann, it was a virtual guidebook to the ancient world. At the age of 46, having made a fortune trading commodities in St. Petersburg, he abandoned his business to pursue a childhood dream, to find the fabled city of Troy. On the advice of British archaeologist Frank Calvert, he went to his side and started digging. Matthias Wright is one of the German archaeologists at Troy. So more than 120 years has passed by since Schliemann was digging here. And this site is still very, very important for, for archaeological research. And nowadays we are working with a great, with a big international team more than 70 scientists are working over the sites there and even today we are making very very important findings almost every day and keep something in mind troy the mystery of troy still exists A member of the American team now excavating at Troy is archaeologist Brian Rose. Schliemann wanted to prove that this was the site where the Trojan War, as described by Homer, had actually occurred. And he had done as much research as he could in libraries and realized he'd never be able to prove it that way. 
So he realized that he had to dig here and dig for quite a while before he was going to be able to prove that the Trojan War that was described by Homer was not a myth, but had actually taken place and had taken place here. This was a major development in archaeology because, well, in fact, archaeology hadn't existed before. Before Schliemann, the 17th century kings and queens of Naples, with a taste for the things of antiquity, dug up statues at Herculaneum and Pompeii and decorated their palaces with them. But this was little more than treasure hunting, not archaeology. Schliemann was trying to prove a point, a scientific point. And he realized that only by excavating here could he prove that point. So he formulated a hypothesis, an idea, and tried to prove it through excavation. That's different from what the kings and queens of Naples were doing. And so that's one of the reasons people call him, in many respects, the father of archaeology. Not knowing where to begin, Schliemann dug a giant trench through the middle of the great mound of Hisarlik. What we're looking at here is the great Schliemann Trench, a major north-south trench which Schliemann cut through the center of the mound. And what you see in the trench are the remains of Troy I houses. So these houses would date between, let's say, uh, 3000 and 2500 BC. Schliemann's dig revealed the ruins of not one, but nine vanished cities one on top of another, which, if any, was the Troy of Homer's Iliad. Here you see the southern extension of the Schliemann Trench that we've been excavating over the last few years, and you get a good idea of how the various cities have formed one on top of the other. The different layers represent cities that existed there during the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, and throughout the Greek, Roman, and Byzantine occupations. So the whole site was settled over the course of 4,000 years, and you see that 4,000-year period simply by looking at the side of a mound. In the second and third levels, Schliemann uncovered massive walls that he believed enclosed the palace of Priam, the fabled king of Troy. He also discovered traces of fire in level two. According to Homer, the city had been burnt to the ground during the Trojan War, but the best was yet to come. June the 17th, 1873, just before the excavations at Hisalik are scheduled to be shut down for the season, Schliemann frantically digs for further evidence that this is indeed the Troy of Homer's Iliad. A workman overturns a pile of rubble. There, beneath the ruins, was gold. Brooches, diadems, chains, bracelets, gold in every shape and form. Send the men home, Schliemann told his wife, Sophia. Tell them it's my birthday. Then with all possible speed, I, I cut out the treasure with a large knife, he later wrote. Ever the romantic, he would later photograph his wife draped in Trojan gold. Schliemann said he found the treasure near Priam's palace. There's been a lot of disagreement about where Schliemann actually found the treasure, or even whether he found it all in one day. But the most likely guess is that it was found in this area, to the side of the Troy II ramp. Almost from the moment of discovery, Schliemann's tale of a treasure belonging to King Priam was called into question. Some of his own contemporaries felt that the lair within the mound where the gold had been unearthed was far older than Priam, if indeed any such king had ever existed. Whether it was Priam's gold or not, Heinrich Schliemann did not want his treasure falling into the hands of the Turks. His discovery had fulfilled a lifelong dream. Now, nothing could keep him from it. Although he'd agreed to give half to the Imperial Museum in Constantinople, the treasure disappeared under a veil of secrecy. Schliemann later admitted that he'd smuggled it to Athens, later taking it to this building in Germany, where it would be on display for nearly 60 years. The gold remained secure in its museum until 1941, when the Second World War began to come home to Berlin. It was then that the British began bombing the city. Not entirely reassured by the presence of the Gestapo headquarters next door, the curators of the Gropius house grew nervous about keeping so many treasures in a vulnerable place. And the gold of Troy would begin its long journey into oblivion.
the Nazis at that time believed to win the whole world, but the curators, I think, they were not so optimistic. Klaus Goldmann is a curator for the Charlottenburg Museum. For over two decades, he searched for what he considers his museum's treasure, the gold of Troy. These replicas, made for a television program, now fill cases meant for Schliemann's find. This book is related to the gift of Schliemann to the German people, to the prehistoric museum. And this shows, really, that uh, we are the rightful owner because all the documentation that is related with the gift is completely uh, here in our office. In 1970, nearly a hundred years after it was first discovered, Goldman set out to find the missing gold. Well, uh, as a curator of a museum, I am in charge of the ownings, and if uh, our material was lost in 45, it's my responsibility to look of the whereabouts. <laughs> and uh, so uh, to look for the whereabouts, you must first uh, confirm yourself what happened. Uh, just temporary beginning of the war, in the war, end of the war. Goldman began his search for the treasure by scouring Nazi wartime archives. His journey would take him back to the dark days of World War II. In 1941, Hitler had ordered all Berlin's museum treasures removed for safekeeping. Schliemann's gold was packed in three numbered but unidentified crates and transported from its home in the Martin Gropius house to a vault in the Prussian State Bank. From there, Goldman's paper trail led him to a flat tower near the zoo in central Berlin, a heavily fortified military installation with walls eight feet thick. Inside, three levels below a nest of anti-aircraft artillery, were kept hundreds of crates of priceless artifacts, including the treasure of Troy. Well, it was in early 41 that the crates with the gold and the highlights of the Bronze Age came from the Gopis building to the strong room of the Prussian State Bank. We are here in this strong room, number seven. And here the crates remained up to the end of 41. Then the museum curators decided to bring them to the Fleck Tower of Seoul. Goldman had confirmed the treasure's last known hiding place. Yet no detailed record of the treasure seemed to have survived. Then, Goldman discovered what he thought might prove to be the key to the whereabouts of the Trojan treasure. I found a documentation that by order of Hitler, all museums had to microfilm their catalogs, their inventory books. After, I think, uh, three months of research, I asked the right question to the right person. And uh, three weeks later, this person came to the director in general, having a big bag with him, and telling, well, here I have the microfilms. And it gave all the documentation of the museum, several hundred thousand finds. With the microfilm in his possession, Goldman now had a complete record of his own museum's pre-war collections, including the objects from Troy. By the spring of 1945, Allied bombs pounded Berlin daily. The tide had turned. As the Russian army closed in, Hitler issued a second order that would play a pivotal role in Goldman's search. Now, I will show you the order given by Hitler on 6th of March, 45, by the chief of the Reichschancellery to the Minister of Culture. Berlin's museums were ordered to evacuate immediately all art, artifacts and treasures from the Flak Tower to the area west of the Elbe River. 
in the direction of the Western Allies, so that nothing should fall into the hands of the advancing Russians. They went southwest in the Thuringian area, and later directly to the west in the lower Saxony area near Wolfsburg, the Volkswagen town. In makeshift caravans, the best of Berlin's artworks were trucked to the salt mines of Western Germany. Naturally bomb-proof and climate controlled, and far away from the advancing Russians, the salt mines also concealed Hitler's and Goering's private collections and countless works of art stolen from the Jews. On March the 23rd, 1945, the Allies crossed the Rhine. Within days, resistance collapsed. By May the 8th, the war was officially over. Two months later, Patton's victorious Third Army reached the salt mines where they found thousands of priceless artifacts. And then I found a, a top secret order from Washington to the four high ranking, highest ranking officials of the European theater with the type eyes only, that means to be burned after being read, going to Supreme Commander Eisenhower, Chief of Staff. The top secret order directed the US Army to remove all the gold and the objects from the salt mines and to bring them to the American zone for safekeeping. And here you can see a visit of the American generals in the salt mine two days later. After the order, you see, you see General Patton in front of crates of some of the departments of the Berlin Museums. And uh, those crates were housed in the Flag Tower Zoo. Goldman thought the Americans had the treasure. But when he compared the serial numbers, his hopes were dashed. And here we have the numbers, complete numbers, what was brought to Marcus, and we have the numbers, what returned to West Berlin, and there is a relatively big difference. Though the Allies had discovered an astonishing collection of uprooted art, it did not include the missing Trojan gold. While much of the art was in American hands, the Soviets were making off with hundreds of thousands of objects from Berlin. A decade later, some would be returned to East Germany. The whereabouts of the Trojan gold still would remain a mystery. Goldman's search had seemingly reached a dead end. And then, in 1989, he was unexpectedly invited to the Soviet Union. The Soviets were looking for a treasure of their own lost during the war. The amber walls stripped from a room in Catherine the Great's palace near St. Petersburg. The Russians wanted to have information from me on the Amber Room, and I wanted to have similar information from them on the Trojan Gold. The Amber Room was stolen by the Germans, and at that time I could uh, believe too that the uh, Trojan Gold was taken over, or say stolen by the Russians. In 1991, Art News magazine claimed that considerable quantities of lost German art had been hidden away in secret depots in the Soviet Union. Among them, buried in the cellar of the Pushkin Museum, was the lost treasure of Troy. Although the Soviets at first denied the report, Goldman's hopes soared. After years of searching for it in the West, could it really be in the East after all? Goldman flew once again to Moscow to investigate the sources of the article. While no one would admit to having seen the gold, he was shown documents purporting to prove that they were in the cellar of the Pushkin Museum. Confirmation that the gold had indeed traveled from Berlin to Moscow came later that year. Handwritten inventories dated June 17, 1945, stated that Soviet troops had removed from the flak tower three big crates containing the treasure. In December 91, I got a phone call from a friend from Potsdam. Uh, I was in my office uh, and he said, well, Klaus, I found some list when cleaning up my room that may be of interest for you. They are written in Russian, and, uh, but I do not know what to do with it. Won't you have a look on it? 
The papers proved for the first time that the Russians had taken the three crates of precious metals out of the flak tower. The crates had been transferred to a special depot in Berlin, then flown to Moscow. Their numbers matched those in Goldman's file. He finally had confirmation that the missing gold had been taken to Moscow. In 1992, the Russian government finally acknowledged possession of the treasure. After nearly 50 years of storage, the treasure's condition is a serious concern, and the question remains, who owns it? After sifting through the archives of war-torn Europe and the once-secret files of the US Army, and uncovering links to the former Soviet Union, Klaus Goldmann remains confident that the treasure will someday be returned to Berlin. I'm optimistic and I know now that it is uh, that the gold survived and uh, we are the owners of it and why should it be uh, kept from another side then if everybody does know now uh, that it survived. There's no uh, juridical uh, possibility to keep it back. It is uh, we are the owners. Those working at Troy today are more concerned with the treasure's condition and restoration than they are with its immediate return to the West. German archaeologist Manfred Kaufmann heads the excavation. Our interest is wherever this is, uh, the treasures are kept, we should look to them and in an international group of people should uh, work on them. The same holds true for the restoration. For sure, these treasures, when the boxes are open, need uh, an expert uh, restoration. So all this, wherever it is, uh, should be done. And uh, it is logical that before all this is decided, where the treasures at the end go, to Turkey, to Greece, to Berlin, uh, that the, this work has to be done. And it is logical, I think, to, not to lose time to do this at Moscow. Kaufman knows that there are more mysteries to be solved once the gold is returned. If Schliemann was wrong about dating the gold, and his contemporaries were convinced that he was, just how old is the gold of Troy? And what will it tell us of this ancient city? If there ever was a prime, and if the Trojan War ever happened, it happened 1300, 1250 before Christ. So these treasures are more than 1,200 years older. That's, say, around 2,500 BC. They're wonderful treasures. They're, one, they're very interesting. But the public would not be much interested, I'm afraid, in these treasures if the name Troy would not connect it with, with them and if Schliemann would not have believed at those days that they are the treasures of prime. Today, after more than a century of archaeological study, Troy itself remains an enigma. It has never definitively been proven that King Priam ruled here, that Helen's face launched those thousand ships, or that Hector and Achilles fought on this plain. But clearly, a series of thriving cities did rise and fall here, and some met with violent ends. The missing gold may yet shed light on those ancient worlds. In the chaos of a world at war, both sides seized their enemies' art treasures and spirited them off behind their own lines. It is estimated that half a million objects may have been taken from the Soviet Union alone by invading German forces. In 1990, the two former rivals signed a treaty of friendship in which they pledged to return to the owners and heirs all works of art illegally carried off during the Second World War. Fulfilling that pledge has proved difficult if not impossible. To date, the treasure of Troy remains in Russia, its fate mired in post-Cold War entanglements.